right. Good evening. We're so glad you joined us um, this evening. You got a treat um, to come and worship, and Seth's going to bring us the word, and so we're excited about hearing what he has prepared. Um, I know it's kind of stressful right now. Ready for finals? Yeah. Some of you are like, we don't have finals, and we're thankful, right? So uh, we'll be praying for y'all as you prepare and uh, get ready for those finals. So let's pray right now as we get ready. Dear Gracious Father, I just thank you so much for how you bring us together as a church, bring us together as believers, that we can come and we can seek you and we can worship you and we can have this camaraderie that we know we're not alone. Father God, that you're pursuing us and that this, as we come together, we're, we have the opportunity to pursue you back, Father, that you can reveal yourself to us and that you can show us that you love us and that you are for us and that you want to have a purpose and a plan for our lives, Father. And so, Father, I just pray that each one that is sitting in these, these chairs right now can just let everything else pass away right now. Let everything just focus on you and be able to worship you and just thank you and with such gratitude in our hearts knowing that you have everything even their future the things that they're stressed about as i've heard so many say this evening already and i pray that you'll give them peace and that they'll show that they trust you and in what their future looks like so we love you god and we praise you we ask you to be in this place as we worship in jesus name amen amen let's stand together
know that there are uh, so many that uh, that are seeking you, that are seeking answers for for things that are going on in their lives that uh, that they're just completely lost. And Father, it is our prayer that uh, that you can uh, uh, wrap them up in your arms. That you can give them uh, mercy. Father, that you can comfort them as only you can. Uh, Lord, we know that you're good. And Lord, we know that, uh, that your sovereignty is real. We know that your power is real. Father, we know that you are real. And Lord, as we continue tonight, just, uh, just let us focus on you. Flood our vision with you, Father. We love you and we praise you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. It's so awesome that you guys make the time to come worship with us. I, um, I'm wearing my Gateway Seminary shirt. I have my final assignment before I'm done with school. For good, for good, I think this time. Uh, and so I'm feeling the weight of what you guys feel. But here's the deal. Um, high schoolers, middle schoolers, y'all don't have a choice. Like, y'all have to go to school. College people, like, you, you don't have to, uh, but I'm glad y'all are. Because as young people, generally, you have a desire to be successful in life. And so uh, kind of the path that has been uh, set before you is to be successful means you go to school. You go to school so you can get a job. You get a job so you can be that person that you want to be. Um, the issue is uh, many people uh, between the age of like 18 and 23, pretty flaky, uh, don't like making hard decisions, especially decisions that like impact your forever. And so we have the tendency, uh, myself included, uh, to just continue to wander around doing school or doing something else to prolong having to make a decision. I worked at Swasu before um, I was at the church and uh, multiple uh, professors, degree programs, said, yeah, we have a ton of students who are doing great in school, but they leave with their bachelor's and even master's degrees, and they can't really get the job that they want. They are overqualified with their degree for the jobs that are out there for them. You see, you, you've done all this school, you have these high expectations for all of this achievement in life, when in reality, like, you probably are going to have to go to work and get some experience before you get to where you need to go. And that's the thing with many of the great leaders in life. Uh, we only see them at the point of kind of admiration, where we want to be like them. We don't see them through the grind. We don't see the entire story. Uh, Earl uh, last week said, I, I've been preaching my best after the age of 60. That meant there was... Uh, 50 years of Earl not doing such a great job. That is, I'm kidding, Earl. I'm, I'm joking. But for us, we didn't get to see that process of Earl becoming the, the man and the preacher that he is today. We just kind of like, oh, I can be like Earl. I want that responsibility. I, I want to I be like him. Not someday, but now. How can I get there as soon as I can? So whether it's preaching, whether it is a certain degree field, whether it's a doctor, um, man, to get to the point of greatness requires work, and often we don't uh, necessarily like the journey to get there. Uh, but we are still in the life of Joseph, and today we're talking about Joseph as a ruler. We get to see kind of these milestones of Joseph's life and how he became this great ruler. And while he's still young, he's, he's age 30 when he assumes this position, he, he qualifies as someone who has gone through the ringer, uh, he has the real world work experience and also um, has the um, education and the training requirements to be um, in the position. And so today we're going to talk about four attributes of a great leader when we look at Joseph's life. Okay, Great leaders have humility. Great leaders lead confidently. Great leaders 
I don't know my next point. Uh, great leaders define authority, and then great leaders give thanks. And in Genesis chapter 41, um, I could read the whole thing to you, but just, I'm going to kind of read the point where Joseph gets put into the position as, um, as a ruler. And so chapter 40, 41, verses 37 through 52. Okay, um, And so let me pick up there. This propo- proposal... Um, so Pharaoh and all of his servants, and Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom the spirit is the spirit of God? When Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and as wise as you are. You shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have sent you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it in Joseph's hand, and clothed him in garments of fine linen, and put on a gold chain around his neck. And he made him ride in the second chariot, and they called out before him, Bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up a hand or foot in all of the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name, Zephanath Paneah, and he gave him to marriage to Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out over the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven plentiful years on earth, they produced ad- abundantly. And then he gathered up all the food of these seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt, and put, on, put the food in the cities. In every city, the food from the fields around it. And Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he ceased to measure it. For it could not be measured. For the year of the famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardships at my father's house. The name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. And so, um, let, when we look at Joseph's life, uh, we have to remember where he came from. And so when we talk about a leader having humility, most people aren't born with that gift. Most of us uh, have to work at it for a lifetime. Uh, when we see Joseph... He, he comes into the story in chapter 37 with this dream. He has, he's, he has these two dreams. And in those dreams, he tells um, his brothers and his fathers, Hey, I've had this dream. I've had this dream, and y'all are going to bow to me. I, I've, had this, I've had another dream. The sun and the stars, they're going to bow to me. You know, when Joseph was younger, he was the center of his own universe. And whenever you're the center of your own universe, you, you probably rub some people the wrong way. You know, Joseph, he, uh, he felt the effect of uh, his arrogance. And sometimes, in order to have humility, you first have to be humbled. In order to, to be the person and get to the place uh, where you're going to be most effective. You see, D-Dog's going to put up a picture of me. Uh, last time I spoke, we talked about me powerlifting. Um, this picture is like fast forward eight, six months from that. This is the start of football season. Uh, so going into my sophomore year, I started as a seventh grader, an eighth grader, a ninth grader. And I was like, all right, it's the next step starting for varsity. So even though I looked like that, I was like, yeah, put on the pads. I, I can do this. And so uh, the f- first game, I uh, weighing 135 pounds in my pads. I, I was in the rotation at receiver. I rode on the varsity bus. I didn't feel like I belonged, but I was like, okay, I can fake it. I can, I can, I can do this. I uh, rode in, wrote, could run plays in, went and blocked, because uh, we didn't throw the ball very much. But then we get to the second game of the year, and uh, we're playing Elgin. And I'm, I'm like, all right, got to ride the varsity bus over to the field. I'm going to get in on the rotation. I'm going to block. I'm like, I can do this. And so we run into play. It was uh, a running back screen. So as a receiver, my role was to go line up as far away as possible and run as far away from possible as possible, like to let, take the corner away. I was like, I can do that. I can run. So I get out there, 
and the quarterback calls an audible because of how the defense was set up, and they call the bubble screen, which, if you don't play football, screen's a screen. If you play football, I go from running far, as far away to possi as possible to being the most important block on the field. And I didn't know this at the time, but the corner that was out in front of me uh, was an all-stater. Like, he, he ended up all-stating that year. And so, me, I'm like, all right, we, we call bubble right, and I'm like, okay, I can do this. So I run out there. I, you chop your steps like you do in practice, and then I'm just ready to block this guy, and he just, yeah, decks me. And I, was, I got up. I knew where I was, but when I went, went to the sideline, I knew that I was no longer going in based off of the, what the coach told me. And I was like, that's how it be. I, also, because he hit me so hard, he didn't make the tackle. So technically, it may have not been a block, but I did my job effectively. Um, but what happened in that moment is that, you know, I, I thought it would just be a linear progress. I would go from start as a 7th grader, 8th grader, ninth grader, start as a, maybe get in at receiver, and then I will just start and start and start and get better and better. And that's not how it went. Sometimes it's those, those hits, those trials that you don't ask for that kind of wake you up to prepare you for the future. You see, I then realized I'm always going to be probably the smallest guy out here, but I'm no longer going to let the bigger, stronger guys hit me first. And so from that point forward, I got after every person um, that I came in contact with. In life, you um, are going to make some selfish and arrogant decisions. And you're going to hurt some people along the way. You're going to get hurt along the way because of these decisions. But the key is to be like Joseph. You see, Joseph had that past background of arrogance, but what he did was he quickly turned and started walking the other direction. Even though he, there was no light at the end of the tunnel after he was sold into slavery and he, he was in prison, he, he didn't acquire that um, arrogance back and said he stayed humble and, and continued to trust in the Lord. For you, like you may be going through some stuff, and you may be being humbled right now. And so what I ask of you is be willing to be humbled, feel that, and then start walking the other direction. Don't double, double down in your selfishness and arrogance and continue leading a life where you're hurting yourself and hurting others. Being a good leader requires having humility. And we see this, um, I didn't read it, but in Joseph's present time, Pharaoh comes to him and he says, hey, I've heard you can interpret dreams. And because the cupbearer that Earl talked about last week, um, or the cupbearer was like, hey, this guy, I met him, previous job, um, he has this ability to interpret dreams. So Joseph gets brought up out of prison, gets clean so he can go into the, um, into where the Pharaoh's presence. And Joseph says this in verse 15 and 16. Pharaoh said, I have a dream and no one can interpret it. I've heard it said that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So what does it look like to to turn that ship around and, and stop being selfish and to walk with humility, it means putting God first and moving yourself back to second. Instead of you being the center of own, your own universe, that you start to think about others more. You see, no longer is Joseph speaking about all of his abilities, all of his authority, but instead he is trusting that the God who got him through slavery and prison is the one as the God who is worth trusting to give him an answer here. You see, being a great leader requires having humility. Uh, and, but humble leaders also lead, with, lead confidently. Often we can associate humility with like shyness or weakness, but the reality is being humble shows your security in who you are. Being humble shows your security in who God says you are. When I uh, 
think about uh, this. It's Romans 12, 3. Romans 12, 1, 2, and 3 are, is kind of my favorite sections of, sections of verses in all of Scripture. And Romans 12, 3 says, Do not think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself, measuring yourself by the faith God has given us. You see, Joseph was clearly gifted with these dreams from the Lord. But when he then realized that I am not capable of answering these dreams on my own, the the Lord clearly has something for me, he was able to put himself in the right place and be maximized, be transformed, and be used for the glory of the Lord. To have security, to lead confidently, comes from experience. You don't gain confidence by um, showing up and trying something for the first time. Uh, Soccer players, uh, who do you put on the mark to kick a PK? The most talented, the most skilled, and the most experienced person who's going to put the ball in the back of the net. You don't don't send up a random person to go try in this uh, pressured environment. Basketball players, who do you put at the free throw line with the game on the line? Not the person who doesn't have confidence that they're going to make it. It's a a person who has worked and practiced to have a confidence in their ability to make the shot. The same is in leadership. See, Joseph wasn't just confident that he was going to be able to, to give an answer to the Lord. He was confident that the Lord was going to provide an answer. Just as the Lord had provided a way out of the pit... Just as the Lord provided a way out of Potiphar's house as a slave, just as the Lord provided a way out of him being in prison, being secure in who God says you are and his purpose for your life allows you to stand before a stranger and trust that God, that God will get you through it. See, Joseph is standing there The pharaoh of Egypt is the most powerful person in the land. What he says goes. And what Joseph didn't do was say, about time, I gave, uh, I answered that guy's um, dream like two years ago. Why why are we we just waiting till now? I've been there. I've had all of this ability. I could have answered, I could have answered all this before today. Why are you waiting till now? To get me. You see, that's not confidence, that's arrogance. But what Joseph did was he stood there before a Pharaoh and didn't just interpret his dream, which he did, but he also gave a plan of action afterward. He said, not, This dream says there's going to be a famine in the land. And what you need to do is to set someone in place to take one fifth of the crops of all the people in Egypt, and stored up for seven years. And then the famine's going to come, but we will be ready. You will be ready. You see, what it means to lead with confidence, that doesn't mean you want to be the one in control. That leading confidently, confidently just means you are ready to respond when you're called upon. See, Joseph didn't ask to be that guy. Joseph Joseph didn't ask for the responsibility. All Joseph said was gave his plan that the Lord gave him. And the result of leading with confidence, leading with obedience to the Lord, his, uh, his intervention in your life. You see, I don't, I don't think Pharaoh knew or worshipped the God of Joseph. I I think it's safe to say he didn't. But what was obvious to Pharaoh was the same thing that was obvious uh, obvious to the jailer was the same thing that was obvious to Potiphar. Something makes this guy different. And so what did Pharaoh do? He said, out of all the people in the land, there's no one like you. And he declared, Joseph, you are going to be the grand vizier. The grand vizier. What that means is he was to be the great 
steward of the land. With that role, he was given a ring. Okay? It, my wedding band is kind of a symbol of my, uh, my union, my marriage with Ashton. What this ring was, was a sign of Pharaoh's stamp of approval. So he wasn't just given the, you're the vice president to my president role. What Joseph was, he was to act on behalf as if Pharaoh spoke things into existence himself. He was responsible to carry that seal and to, be, and to steward the survival of the nation. You see, Joseph became the man in charge. There was no one before him. Think back to chapter 37. What did Joseph's dream say? Everyone will bow before you. What happened in chapter 41? Joseph made it. Everywhere he went, he wore the robe of royalty. He wore the ring of the king of earth. And everywhere he went, people were commanded to bow at, it, at his arrival. This is the inflection point for Joseph's life. It wasn't in the pit of despair. It wasn't as he was fleeing from Potiphar's wife. It wasn't as he's sitting in a jail cell. This was the moment of inflection because he finally made it. See, often we, we think that um, the decisions we make when no one is watching um, will, will determine our future, and it does, and it's true. It builds you up. The things you do in the dark builds you up. But it's also the person you are in the light that shapes the person you'll be in the future. And so as a leader, you can't just, uh, you have to walk with humility. You have to lead confidently. But then you also have to define authority. And here's the thing about authority. This was the moment that Joseph could have taken all of that back. Having the power, Joseph could have taken all of that back. He didn't have to be humble anymore. Everyone had to listen to him. He didn't have to be confident in the Lord's provision because he could be confident in his self to provide and to protect. See, this was the moment that Joseph had to define who was going to rule his life. And it would have been easy for Pharaoh to become Joseph's authority. Since Pharaoh granted him the platform to rule, Joseph could have been under Pharaoh's authority and no one would have said anything. And that signet ring, that ring, that seal of approval, what that showed was Pharaoh trusted him with his life, with all of his possessions, with his family, with his kingdom. You see, Joseph lost his father. Joseph lost his family years earlier. Now someone stepped in that space. And this was the inflection point. How is Joseph going to respond? You see, that ring gave him the power. You know, it gave him the responsibility, the control. Uh, think about, how did Joseph, this um, person of Israel, this Jewish man, come into Egypt and then command the entire nation to give up one-fifth of their crops? They didn't willingly give up everything, they, a fifth of what they owned to this stranger. They did so because he had the ring. Like, would you guys give up a fifth of everything that you own, everything that you make every year to the U.S. government? The answer is yes, because you do. Um, but you do because 
there's the potential of punishment on the other side. You know, the punishment for us is jail. For the punishment for the people of Egypt is probably not just one-fifth of what they own, but all, of that, all that they own and all of their life was probably going to be taken. Again, Joseph was the man. And instead of bowing to the authority of Pharaoh, he used this worldly platform this country that doesn't believe in God, this Pharaoh that doesn't believe in God, he uses this platform as a gift to continue to give God the glory to save the nations. Your life is going to reach a point where you have to define who the authority of your life is going to be. Because the world is going to have strong pools like I said at the beginning, you, your parents may have set this expectation that you get this degree, you go get this job, and you become successful. You may put these expectations on yourself. That th- this is the person I want to marry, this is the life I want to live, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to accomplish that. Whether to a country, to a person, to a job, to a sport... Who are you going to let run and rule your life? Is your life being surrendered to the authority of your circumstances? Is your life being surrendered to the, to the needs and the wants and the wills of the people around you? Or is the blood of Christ going to be the authority? Is the blood of Christ going to be that stamp of ownership? That signet ring that brings you to the Father? Are you going to wear that ring? You see, the blood of Christ is a gift. A relationship with Jesus is a gift. But you have to be willing to walk under the authority and the leadership of the Lord and to surrender yourself to his plan for your future. You see, even though Joseph wore the ring of Pharaoh, the authority of his life was still the king of the universe. What ring are you going to wear? Ephesians 2.19 says, if you put on this ring, if you are identified with Christ and his blood, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Build on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Are you willing to let God be the authority in your life. Great leaders walk with humility. Great leaders lead confidently. And great leaders define authority. And finally, if you are living a life this way, if you are trusting in the Lord to provide and to direct all of your life, you're going to come out the other end, and as a great leader, you're going to give thanks. When we, get, when we see Joseph at the end of his life, the whole plan is rolling out exactly how the Lord said it would. He was being obedient. The land was fruitful. He was profitable. And then it comes to uh, verse 50. Before the famine came, he had two sons. The firstborn named Manasseh, And the second he called Ephraim. See, all that Joseph had accomplished, the authority that he had over all people, that wasn't the thing that he looked at and took pride in and took joy in. More than anything, he saw these two sons that he was gifted with, and he couldn't help think about where he had come from. 
when he was staring death in the face, when he was a prisoner, a slave, he finally reached this point and he looked at these two sons and he saw this story of his life and he couldn't help but give thanks to the Lord for bringing him through it. He said, Manasseh, the name that, show, that means to forget the past and to move forward. Ephraim, to be fruitful with the opportunity to live a new day. You see, whenever you lead a life of obedience, and you get to walk with confidence, and you're, you're secure in who the Lord says you are, it won't all be easy. It may not, may not always make sense. But I promise you, if you walk with the Lord, you're going to come out on the other end and you're going to get to look at your past and just be thankful how the Lord provided every step of the way. And because you had him in the past and you have him in the present, you, that also means you are secure in the future, no matter what else comes your way. In Joseph's life, in all the power and the ruling authority that he had, he still still rested with thanksgiving for how the Lord continued to provide in his life. And, and lastly, I, if you don't, if you can't relate, if you look at, out at your life and you never turned around from being the, the selfish and arrogant person from your past, if you never stopped, started walking in the direction of the Lord, if you doubled down on being selfish and arrogant and you've hurt people and you've hurt yourself along the way because if you try to you've tried to figure it out on your own and you realize you can't but you don't know where to go, if you are still that person, if you are still lost and alone, the Father is still waiting. Austin pointed out that these things that Pharaoh clothed Joseph with are the exact same things that the, that the prodigal son was met with when he came back to the presence of the father. He was met with the ring of the family. He was met with a robe of fine linen because it showed the love that the father has for those who come to him. So as we close, if you, if you can't look back at your life and give thanks to what the Lord has done in your life because you don't know him, come to him today. Every day is an opportunity to turn from your old life and to find new life. We are here celebrating Christmas for the next month. Is Jesus the person that you worship? Is Jesus the person that you are celebrating? Or are you still celebrating yourself? Come to him and watch him work and transform your life. Pray with me. God, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, I want to thank you for Joseph's example. Uh, Lord, you uh, give him as man, he hits all, his, all of the positive marks of a great leader. And Lord, we're never going to be rulers over a country. But Lord, you give us leadership responsibility over a few. But Lord, in order to do that well, we have to walk with these simple truths that, that Joseph displayed. But Lord, it's hard to live out attributes of a leader for Christ if we don't know you. So Lord, if there's people in this room that don't know you, Lord, draw them to yourself. Draw them to you. Lord, let them surrender in obedience and trust that you are the authority over their life. And Lord, if there's people in this room who have trusted you and they, they know you, Lord, let this next month not just be a celebration of, about being done with school or a celebration about being with family and presence, but Lord, let this next month be a celebration of thanksgiving, knowing what you have done for us, that you have sealed us, you have secured us because the gift of Jesus and with that gift that you have given us the Holy Spirit to live and breathe, to walk with you each day. 
Lord, you are good. Lord, let our lives be reflective of your goodness. God, we love you and thank you. Amen. Let's stand together.
Y'all so much for being here tonight. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, next week is our last gathering of the semester. Uh, yeah. So uh, definitely come out. You're going to get to hear. Uh, it's like youth night. Uh, youth band, youth speakers. They're going to do a wonderful job. So come on out and support them next week. Again, thank you all so much for being here. You're dismissed. Resolve. My bad. Great job, guys.